Hey guys, so today I am going to be answering the first of your questions that I asked you and that you guys kindly uh, submitted down in the comments section of, uh, not I believe the last video, but the video before that. So I'm going to be answering probably about one question per video, maybe if like two questions sort of a, about very similar uh, subject matter, then I might um, you know, blend them into one video. And then at the end, I might then just do a compilation of leftover miscellaneous questions that maybe um, are quite short, I guess. That would be the way that I would look at doing these things. But really, I'm just looking for a starting off point to talk about various different topics. It's... Um, it can be quite uh, difficult when you've got like the entire world of open source available to you. Where to go and what to look at and what to think and, and, and what people are um, are really interested in and are going to be, uh, you know, sort of uh, receptive to as well. Because, of course, you've always got, you know, the, the, yeah, like, you know, it's just a matter of, of, of constantly coming up with, uh, with ideas that are not only, you know, uh, video worthy, but also, you know, um, worthy of comment as well because really at the end of the day um i think the comment section is 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 actually quite important to a lot of youtube creators because it does it gives back a very tangible recognition that we're not speaking into the void like it doesn't matter how many likes there are or dislikes there are or views there are um I've put out uh, I've put out videos on, on on YouTube on other YouTube channels that aren't really sort of like built up. They're usually for like non profits or, or what have you. And um, even though they can sort of garner a lot of views because they're very shareable on Facebook and all that kind of stuff, uh, the the commentary is not really uh, as coherent as it is with YouTube channels that have a an audience that has you know like a sustained uh, viewership, as it were. So. Um, Anyway, just to round all of that rambling off, uh, yeah, so I, I'm sort of using your questions, I'm obviously going to answer, be answering your questions, but also use them as a sort of inspiration for um, ideas and, uh, and, and thoughts and commentary as well. So, today I am going to kick off with a question from Big Daddy Linux. Uh, check out the channel, by the way, good channel. Do you see a day where the desktop goes by the wayside in the future? I would like to think that the desktop will always be relevant, but people keep talking about the post-PC era. Reminds me, actually, when I first read that question, it, it re reminded me of an article I read in a newspaper we have over here in the UK called The Guardian, and it was talking about how the ownership in desktop computers was on the decline, and how a lot of people were preferring to use tablets for a lot of their day-to-day, -day, uh, you know, living and 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 effectively using a tablet as their daily driver. Now this might include a tablet with a, a, a Bluetooth keyboard uh, or it might it might be one of those Microsoft Surface things or anything like that. I don't necessarily know what they were referring to as a tablet versus a laptop here. Um, maybe the chipset might have been the uh, the, uh, the the cutoff I guess if it uses... Uh, but there are tablets to use... Uh, are there tablets to use um, x64 processors? Or x84 processors, 64-bit processors. I don't know. I mean, I, I I assume it's all ARM, but I could I I I do not know that uh, I do not know enough about phones there. But yeah, effectively, um, it is quite interesting to see how tablets have this impact on the market because uh, they are sort of in in a way the opposite end of desktop computers, aren't they? Whereas desktop desktop computers. You can liken them to maybe a heavy goods vehicle on the road, uh, you know, one of those one of those big haulage vehicles, and then you can perhaps liken a tablet to a sensible, um, you know, hatchback that you might see more in a in a city. Uh, so you know, it's different horses for different courses to put a rather uh, overused expression on it. So um, I think that. I think that there'll always be this degree of diversity because there'll always be this this uh, differing degree of, of needs. You're never. Uh, I mean, can you really see the day when we will be administrating servers from a from a tablet? Actually, as I say that, I I probably can because you know administrating a terminal, all you need is an SSH terminal, really, isn't it? That's all you need to do to administrate servers. So I guess in a lot of ways, um, sysadmin stuff can. Um, uh, doesn't necessarily need it, but when you look at heavy lifting, I suppose you're you're not necessarily looking at 
uh, at that, but more specifically maybe video games and movie editing. And um, I suppose like video editing and pictures and stuff like that as well. But yeah, heavy lift, lifting where where hardware is required. But um, what is also interesting about the, the tablets as well is that they're not actually um, being uh, cycled through. Like the planned obsolescence that all these companies have, have, have planned for all these tablets, people aren't actually buying them at the rate that they were expected because people buy a tablet. A tablet isn't so much the status symbol as it was marketed as, as like maybe a phone is. Uh, whereas, oh, you go around town with a fancy latest iPhone or what have you and impress all your friends, your tablet is the thing that stays at home on your coffee table where only a very small number of people are likely to, to see it. And it's really a, a, a utilitarian, you know, it's, a, it's a tool in so much it's the, it's the thing that you browse a website when you're in front of the TV. And really, uh, the hardware that um that is required to do that has been around for quite some time it's not particularly difficult to put into a tablet and the newer tablets don't offer anything uh above the standard experience these days unless i'm wrong and maybe 3d emojis are suddenly the be all and end all of everything i don't i don't know i'm not um i miss emoticons you know like with the, when you put the the colon and the hyphen and the bracket you know like that was so I don't know. I like those. Those those are my emoji of choice. Um, so people are definitely ditching the desktop, and the desktop is is it does seem to be when when it's at home in more the gaming uh, heavy lifting space, whereas maybe clerical tasks and light use might more uh, default more to a laptop. And well, will there be a day when? Hardware just isn't an issue for this kind of thing uh, in the same way that nowadays, if you want to browse, well, I say if you want to browse a website, the, the, you can use a reasonably old computer, and I suppose I still reserve that to be true so far, but I mean, websites are even getting pretty hefty in terms of the amount of CPU usage they have, and heaven forbid, uh, should they start baking Bitcoin miners into websites? I've, I've heard a bit about that, but I, I don't think I've seen it in action. So, um, oh no, I, I think there was there was one website, wasn't there? There was one website that uh, they said instead of turning off uh, yeah, they said instead of running ads, you could they'll run, they can run a Bitcoin miner in the background. And that's like a substitute for advertising. And it caused quite a bit of a controversy at the time. It was very interesting to, to actually consider um, Bitcoin mining as a, uh, as a you know, as, as that kind of form of revenue. I don't think it's anything that I would like to see really go widespread. But it's, you know, like it's an idea. It's an interesting idea um, when it comes to monetizing content on the Internet. Um, you know, when, short of advertising and a tipping system, we don't have the world of options here, especially if you're like a free software advocate and, putting stuff behind paywalls just seems so uh, contrary to the community i guess i know that the that i i i'm that 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 opinion is not shared by everyone but um you know i i have you know when someone makes a piece of open source software and and they open source it that's a gift to the world and um and, and and when and and that really sort of you know that idea inspired me that 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 sort of generosity in and of itself inspired me to start this channel as a way to talk about this that kind of stuff and even should this channel ever get big enough signal boost uh really good open source projects so that people can make great use of them and so that good work could go um can go even further so anyway i'm getting well off track here now so i'm going to try and round it back but uh, as long as hardware is still an issue, as long as we don't live in that day where, uh, you know, you, you might buy a computer and it will last you until it drops, you know, it's not like, um, uh, you know, well, I suppose even in, in the old days where you'd buy an old car, but I don't even know, you know, they've put planned obsolescence into cars nowadays, haven't they? So I don't even know how long a car, like if, if I, you know, I mean, the car that I drive right now is, is, is reasonably new. I think it was it was made in the last uh, t two years at least. So how long can I expect to keep that before it becomes uh, obsolete? It's not a particularly smart car. It's reasonably normal in its vehicular nature. But uh, yeah, planned obsolescence kind of thing. And that's rather interesting, actually, bringing it back to the desktop. Because what I love about the desktop, why I run a desktop, and why I'm sure many of you guys run a desktop, is because it's a really cost-effective way to have a really speedy PC. Um, 
it allows you to replace part by part for the most part. Uh, sometimes if you have to do a big um, upgrade, then you might need to uh, upgrade quite a few things at once. For example, if you upgrade the motherboard, you might need to upgrade the RAM because it's DD, you know, and you might need to upgrade the CPU or you might need to upgrade the motherboard if you want to upgrade the CPU and um, uh, and so forth. Um, so a desktop does allow you to it soften the blow when you want to say you can buy an, a, a, a graphics card separately. You can buy a... You can buy a CPU. You know, well, you can buy a CPU separately. You can buy RAM separately. You can buy hard uh, disk drives separately. And even with my last uh, computer, uh, I actually managed to really sort of keep it going, really far beyond its years by just uh, you know upgrading things uh, like the um, like the hard disk drive and everything like that. You know, like upgrading from a spinning disk, an optical disk drive to a to a solid state one was uh, was really quite uh, quite a performance boost as well. So as long as hardware is still an issue of um, of importance, I think that there will always be a place because the desktop is the best place to optimize a high performance machine. Um, but whether or not that share will be as big, who knows? I'm not entirely sure that it will matter because I think there are plenty of people that are interested in high performance. Um, computers and customizable computers as well. That um, that they'll they'll be a decent um, a market share around, and it actually got me thinking as to you know a lot of thoughts I've had lately about Linux's market share, and whether or not like what's a good market share, what would count as a successful. Market? People say Linux is or isn't successful, as if it's like an empirical objective statement. I, you know, I use Linux day in day out. I'm not even interested in Windows, and that, that I think is the the genuine feeling I have towards Windows these days is just disinterest. If it's if it's not available, I just you know it's not a hatred, it's not a loathing, it's not a protest, it's not advocacy against condemnation or anything like that. It's really just disinterest. If you if everything that I see, all this proprietary software that gets developed for Microsoft, all I see is is, is a a party that I'm not invited to in a lot of ways. Um, and, and a lot of that might have been because I, I felt closed out of a lot of proprietary software when I couldn't afford it. So open source was there, and now I feel part of a community that I don't think being a consumer of a product would have allowed me to be. Because that's the difference between open source software and what you buy off the shelf in a truly meaningful, you know, Richard Stallman kind of way, is that when you are buying a, a proprietary piece of software, you are purchasing a... A product. In fact, I think Richard Stallman might take it a few steps further in saying that you're you're probably enslaving yourself. But, um, <laughs> but yeah, like I mean, uh, when you buy a proprietary piece of software, you are buying a product. When you are using a piece of open source software, you're participating in uh, a community. I think it is, or you're at least, um, yeah, you are. You're pa you're participating in a community. Maybe not to a particularly large degree, but every time a piece of open source software is used, and every time a a, a work of art is created, or a piece of art, or a piece of anything, you know, a, a problem is solved with a piece of open source software. That gives that piece of so open source software a little bit more uh, credibility and relevance and usefulness to humanity as a as a whole, and. Yeah, you know, it's it's something you you measure by the the genuine, meaningful, soulful benefit that it provides, rather than uh, revenue. And that's not to say that you know, uh, fiscal matters in the economy aren't important. Um, but it uh, is it, to me significantly more interesting. I think that's the word I I, I would use: is interesting, insightful, uh, it, it, meaningful. It makes you feel more of um you know how marketing you know how marketing just tries to be all horrendously chummy with you like it like an ad you know how adverts like try to be your friend oh you must be like bob bob buys this kind of car insurance and does this kind of thing you know it's like the first uh first act of fight club in uh in uh in that kind of way it's all that kind of manufactured um nonsense to try and separate you from from your money and um and i think open source can just be a bit of a liberation from that you know it's not necessarily a commentary on uh on society or life as a whole maybe it is but um but it's nice that there's a respite from it so um and I think that that carries through to the desktop because I think the desktop also carry you know carries this this spirit of 
uh, rolling up your sleeves, getting your hands dirty and being part of a community. And when you buy uh, hardware comp components, you are buying products as well. There's not really a way around that because you are buying labor from someone else. You are buying resources from someone else. So obviously that is uh, particularly fair. Um, and obviously with open source projects, you know, like the the the, the labor itself is, you know, like it's someone has paid for it or it is it has come out of uh, some kind of, um, you know, someone uh, someone has paid the piper and that's why I always try and make sure to uh, support open source projects when I can. And uh, if you want to see a list of open source projects that I do support, um, it isn't exactly many because I ain't exactly flush with cash, but I think that it's always important just to donate even just a small amount because it keeps it in your mind so that when you do have more money, you sort of, you, I suppose you know what to do with it, really, I guess. It's just a, uh, um, but yeah, there's a list on my Patreon page. So sometimes I'll like switch out um, one project for another over time. Uh, so, um, so I don't know, I guess it's worth checking back. But yeah, if you want a list of, um, I think my, I'm pretty sure my Patreon pledges are just stuck to the front page of my uh, Patreon page. So that's pretty, um, pretty useful. I think basically off the top of my head, the, dis the uh, it's Ubuntu Mate and Solus are the two distributions that I got cash going out to. Um, and I think I got uh, a donation going out to Linux Rocks and Mastodon, and, you know, things like that. So I've usually stuff that I've talked about on the channel before. Um, so just to round it off, um, this thought that I've sort of <laughs> been meandering towards is that if we get to a, a place where a large section of people use tablets, maybe 40 to 60%, it would be um, people who, it would be the device that people use who aren't in, interested in computers. They might file their taxes on it. They might do a bit of online shopping, buy presents, etc. But they're, they're certainly not high performance users. Then you might get 20 or 30% who use a laptop for work use, maybe. Or maybe they are a like a, a community volunteer and they use a laptop for email correspondence. Or maybe they are a, I don't know, an author or a writer or someone someone that that that, that, that is that is a serious computer user but not necessarily in regards to the hardware that they require. So they want something like a proper keyboard. Um you know, like maybe be sort of uh, a better selection of software and, 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 and a mouse and that kind of thing. And then the remaining people might be uh, significantly in the bracket of power users. Now, Linux could become a significantly larger market share among that, you know, among desktop users, because desktop users then starts to fill the niche of the almost the DIY computer, almost like the 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 sort of the power user enthusiast niche or niche rather of computing and, and technology and Linux definitely fits that role better than Windows um, or at least certainly is competitive to so um, it could be interesting we could see Linux get a market share but I as I said earlier in the video market share is a bit of a nonsense statistic because Linux works for me day in and day out and that's to me in my little you know narcissistic bubble uh, that's really all that matters um, obviously kind of it doesn't because I've got a YouTube channel and I heavily evangelize about Linux, but in, you know, in that sort of, in that theory, if, you know, like what works for you works for you is, is, is a great little thing there, but Linux does work for me in every capacity. And I, uh, and it's very difficult to even compare Linux to Windows now because I'm so out of touch with it. And also because the, the sort of evolutionary paths have divulged quite a lot in so much that, or diverged rather, in, in so much that, yeah, there might be a technique of doing something in Windows, entirely different technique of doing it in Linux, but I've adopted a more Linuxy way of thinking and thus, you know, so, you know, it's, it's not so much that Linux is better or worse even than solving the problems with Windows because more often than not you come up against an entirely different set of problems. So, you know, it's, um, and after time, like Linux just becomes so much more comfortable, but it takes time. It does. I always do find that. And uh, one of the questions later on down is, is going to be, or there are going to be a, few, a couple of questions about introductions to Linux. There are uh, a number of new users who have, who've, or newer users or users that think of jumping to Linux that have asked questions, and I will be covering uh, those. But I will always preface by saying that, and, and I, I, I feel a little elitist when I say this, and it feels horrible, but... I do think that it is important to say that like Linux is hard and it's not for the intellectually lazy. 
and I really hate saying that, but it's like you, you know, but but it does. It takes genuine effort to learn a different way of doing things, a different way of computing to get your head round it, and. I, it's not an intelligent, I don't believe, you know, it's not like, oh, Linux isn't, I'm not saying that Linux isn't for stupid people or smart people. It's not a reflection on intelligence. It's, it's a reflection on uh, an individual's will to learn, if you know what I mean, a will to put in the effort. Effort is, is what's required. So, you know, I don't want to be too harsh when I say that, but like, you know, it, it's, and, and effort means, really, it means time. I think time as well. Um, uh, so you know, like uh, when it comes to that kind of thing, I, I I will I will look at options of uh making the transition from from Windows to Linux as soft and as smooth and also as reversible as possible, so that people always feel comfortable. Anyway, that's about a ramble and a half in it, and I, I I'm pretty sure I covered the question. Um, but thank you, uh, thank you very much, Big Daddy Linux, for your question and all of your uh, your YouTubey goodness in general as well. Um. So, thank you. Yes, and uh, and that's about it for me today. Until next time, uh, I've been Chris Ware, and you've been awesome. Take care now.